Hey, hey everybody, this is Arnold Schmidt. I'm with Randy Siefkin, and we're delighted to uh, welcome you to this month's Modesto Noir featuring uh, Arsenic and Old Lace with uh, Cary Grant. It's a real hoot. Uh, I'm a professor of English and film and creative writing at uh, the Stan State here in Turlock. Uh, and Randy is uh, going to introduce himself. <laughs> So I am a retired professor of political science at Modesto Junior College, where I specialized in American and California politics. I am now a board of the Historic State Theater, and I was one of the founders of the Modesto Film Society, which specializes in screening classic movies at the State Theater on a monthly basis. Great. And so we're going to talk about, um, about Arsenic and Old Lace, which is directed by Frank Capra, a director that um, is familiar to many of us. Uh, he's an, an, an Italian-American immigrant. Uh, he's from Sicily, uh, worked his way through school, actually studied engineering, um, but became a filmmaker, uh, worked in the silent period with uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, famous people, Harry Langdon, Claudette Colbert, Douglas Fairbanks. Um, some really interesting silence. And then in sound, um, he's probably best remembered for the films that won Oscars. It happened one night. Uh, Mr. Deeds goes to town and you can't take it with you. And uh, it, for most of us, especially since it became uh, a Christmas staple, it's a wonderful life. Um, he, um, uh, here's images of him with uh, uh, Claude Colbert from uh, uh, It Happened One Night, the famous hitchhiking scene. Uh, he can't get a ride hitchhiking in the top right. She lifts up her skirt and gets a right, uh, the ride right away, bottom right. Um, in uh, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town um, with uh, Gary Cooper. Uh, and um, You Can't Take It With You, which uh, I, I think is particularly something to think about because it's also a play that's adapted um, to a movie as is Arsenic and Old Lace. This one by um, uh, Moss and, and Kaufman, a very, a very funny, uh, funny play, a very funny movie. And then it's a wonderful life. So one of the most uh, things that I think is most relevant here with Frank Capra is what critics call Capricorn. And Capra is known for really corny, silly kinds of physical gags. He starts out, as I mentioned, in silent film as a gag man and uh, as, a, as a silent film director, but he does a bunch of comedy and he's, he's known for his gags. And so in It Happened One Night, as, as anyone who's seen it will remember, um, there's a sequence where the two of them are traveling together. They have to share a room. And so they put up this blanket between them. And um, at the end, the blanket comes down. Uh, there's this famous, um, you know, that he's like, he, she, he asked for a trumpet so he can blow down the walls of Jericho. Uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a sight gag. Um, the uh, hotel uh, owners on the bottom left are commenting on it. On the bottom right, we have the couple now, uh, now married and, um, you know, all, all set for a connubial bliss. Um, in It Happened One Night, it, It's a Wonderful Life, we get a really good, another really good example of this, perhaps a better example, where every time George Bailey runs down the stairs, he grabs the um, banister, the top of the banister, and it comes off in his hand. And this is, you know, it's anybody who owns a house or rents a house that you have to do repairs on your, you know, this is familiar territory. Oh yeah, I got to fix that. But anyway, it's a sight gag that happens over and over again. Um, and in um, and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which is, you know, generally um, has a lot of kind of serious elements to it, even though it's a comedy. Um, but the physical comedy is the scene uh, with, um, you know, where he's meeting the senator and he keeps, he drops his hat and he kicks his hat and he kicks over a, a lamp. And so there's all of this, this physical gags. Um, so this is one of the things we definitely want to look, think about as we're watching Arsenic and Olace. There's a lot of really funny physical, there's a lot of funny stuff generally. Some of it is situation comedy, some of it is dialogue, um, but much of it is, is, is this kind of the, these kinds of, um, of gags um, that are in a certain sense farcical. One of them, them in particular you want to think about is what goes on with the body where they have this extra body and they're moving them in and trying to hide them and all that kind of thing. So Arsenic and Old Lace was written by um, a George uh, Kessering. Um, he's a New York writer um, and uh, he started out as a teacher in Kansas, uh, Bethel College, 
and then he went and became uh, a, a writer and, uh, and a producer and actor. He had four plays uh, on Broadway in total. There's Wisdom and Women, Arsenic and Old Lace, by, him, by, by far his biggest success, 12 Fours or 48, and Mother of That Wisdom. Um, the play itself is one that, um, uh, you know, the, the background on this a little bit, it was um, uh, originally um, called uh, Bodies in Our Cellar, and um, when he brought it to, uh, to the producers, um, it, you know, there's, there's some talk about how much they contributed to helping him rewrite it and focus it. Um, but in any event, it's a very tight, very funny play. Um, and it, it turned into a very funny, uh, very funny movie. Um, in 1941, when the play came out, uh, the, the Americans are not yet in the war, um, but they, you know, they, they're, they know Europe is happening, terrible things have been going on. And I think it's important to kind of keep in mind that, you know, we have, um, we have Mussolini in North Africa in the late 30s. We have, um, we have Spain um, and, and things go, civil war in Spain. Um, so in other words, even though the war ha hasn't, you know, then, then the war breaks out with, with Germany. But in other words, it's been, it's been a number of years where a lot of really serious things are going on. Particular, another thing that, that it's actually mentioned in the play is um, what, what, uh, what comes to be known as the rape of Nanking and the Japanese uh, invasions of, uh, of China. And there's a, a kind of an aspersion against, uh, against uh, the Japanese in the play. So not that America is yet involved, um, at least when this opens, but, um, but uh, they are, um, certainly Europe is on their mind. And this is in some ways very escapist, but there are a few mentions of the war in there that, that kind of bring it to mind. Um, I, it's, I think it's interesting to note, and I think almost kind of touching to note, the thing about the film being played in, in, in London and the idea that many of the people who were coming to see it were people who were, who were victims of the Blitz. Um, so the play ran um, uh, 1,444 performances on Broadway, 1,337 in London, um, and uh, the longest of any uh, of in, in London of any American play. And Randy, you were saying it's the longest running uh, on Broadway as well? Not, uh, it's, it's among the uh, top longest running. Yeah, so it's great fun. It's, it's, it's great fun as a play, and of course it makes a wonderful movie, which Randy's now gonna tell you about. So it was actually produced in 1941, which allowed European audiences to see it, uh, but was not released uh, to general distribution until 1944, which made it ineligible for the awards for 41, 42, 43, and 44. Uh, it's interesting to me that this was part and a part obviously driven by the war because it had put it, been put in the can in 1941 and was supposed to have been released in 1942 to the domestic market. Uh, but because of an agreement with the producers of the play, it was decided to keep it out of theaters until the Broadway uh, series had run its course, which it did in 1944. Actually, American troops got to see it earlier than that. It was sent around to the various, uh, the various uh, theaters of war, uh, obviously as a morale builder, uh, although the references to death might not have been appreciated by American GIs abroad. So this was the opening the title card for this film, a fairly typical uh, device to provide context, um, Halloween tale of Brooklyn where anything can happen and it usually does. Yeah, and I think this is in some ways as a New Yorker, there's a New York gag here. When somebody, when a New Yorker says New York, they mean Manhattan. Um, and it's only within the last 10 years that suddenly Brooklyn has usurped Manhattan as the center of the, uh, the greater metropolitan area. And I think that setting this in Brooklyn and particularly the fact that the, um, the two ants are very Victorian and the minister is very Victorian. It's almost like if you've ever seen a tree grows in Brooklyn, you know, it's, it's, it, it, there's this image of Brooklyn as kind of familial backwater. It's not Manhattan. It's not Broadway. It's not Greenwich Village. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting and I think important, setting it there is, is important. And it does open with a baseball uh, game, 
uh, featuring the Van Brooklyn Dodgers now. The that's right, that's right. So, so here's a, a an outtake of Cary Grant and Frank Capra. Um, Grant was borrowed from Columbia for this particular role. His salary was listed at $100,000 or $160,000, depending upon what sources you consult. He turned over his salary to the British war effort and the Red Cross and the USO. Um, for those of you who know anything of, of, of uh, Grant's background, you know that he was a Brit. Uh, there was some, some sources say that Capra really wanted Bob Hope to play Mortimer not Cary Grant, uh, but Hope wanted to, and Hope wanted to play the role, but he was under contract and could not uh, do it. And the cast, uh, you see Priscilla Lane as the uh, prospective bride in the film. I think her most notable role besides this one was in the Alfred Hitchcock movie, Saboteur, which was made around the same time. Uh, the, the sisters, uh, Josephine Hull and Jean Adair, um, who, who, who got their kicks by poisoning, I think, 12 people uh, over the course of the, uh, the film. And yeah. one, one of the running gags is who's killed more people, yes. and whether you count the first one who died, <laughs> yes. time, but may or may not be included. So uh, the, this, this idea of keeping a scorecard of how many corpses we have is, is, is part of the fun in a certain sense. And, and Gina Dare um, is an interesting character because she's in the upper left on the top photo. She knew uh, Cary Grant when he was uh, not Cary Grant, but Archie Leach uh, back in the vaudeville days. And she helped nurse him back to health when he had a serious uh, uh, challenge with uh, uh, a bout of the flu, as I recall. Uh, Peter Lorre as Dr. Einstein, the classic character, first came to American attention as uh, in the film uh, M, where he played a serial killer of children, uh, obviously uh, in Casablanca as uh, Ugalde, who, who uh, had the, the papers, which were sought after by all the major parties in the film. And of course, in the film we are showcasing next month, uh, the Maltese Falcon. Uh, uh, Josephine Hall and Gina Dare came over to the, the film, um, which is one of the reasons why they didn't want to lose the filmmaker, the uh, playmakers uh, did not want to lose the uh, Boris Karloff as uh, the, the lead in the leading villain's role uh, on the stage. And here are Cary Grant and Priscilla in the graveyard. If you look closely, one of the gravestones has the name Archie Leach on it. <laughs> that, enough. That's great. And I think them thematically, it's important to, to think about this film, especially in the sense of it's, that it's during the war, that it's, it is a very bold comedy with physical comedy and farce and all those things that we've talked about already. But... It's set in a house that is next door to a cemetery and that at the end is donated to the church because they don't want to report all the bodies to the police. <laughs> so the house is, in a sense, already a cemetery. So this kind of connection between the living and the dead uh, and the cemetery is, is, uh, is thematic all the way through. Uh, I mean, it ends with the wedding, which is very life affirming, but it is also um, there's a lot of deadness in here. <laughs> I, think that, I think they'd have to disclose that, don't you, if they sold the property? Today they would. I bet they didn't then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, the censors were concerned about the relationship um, between Mortimer and Priscilla Lane's characters uh, be because of the, quote, sexual tension, quote, unquote. And they advised that it needed to be toned down. 
So here's Boris Karloff, who, original, who originated the role of Jonathan on Broadway, and Raymond Massey, who played Jonathan in the film and was made up to look like uh, Frankenstein. Uh, here you see them side by side, which required them, because of, because of Karloff's identification with the character Frankenstein, to get a release from Karloff to allow the name Frankenstein and the visage Frankenstein in the film. This also required about two hours of makeup on Massey's part and uh, two hours to take the makeup off of Mr. Massey, at least according to the handout from the Warner Brothers, or from uh, the uh, uh, Warner Brothers uh, press office. And, th and this becomes a running joke throughout the whole, uh, the whole play. On the one hand, um, Jonathan has had many faces. Einstein keeps giving him different, you know, disguising him, so he keeps giving him different faces. But apparently, uh, Peter Lorre, ca character Dr. Einstein, had, had been drunk and had seen Frankenstein and then <laughs> given him this face, <laughs> being drunk while he was operating on him. Um, so the jokes that keep coming up is there's something that, um, that uh, Cary Grant says to him, um, it's bad enough that you, you know, to be monstrous, but you have to look monstrous. Um, there's a, uh, a, 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 people keep saying, well, wait a minute, you just, you'd look like Boris Karloff. And he gets really <laughs> upset by that. And toward the end of the, of the, of the, of the play of the movie, um, Einstein is supposed to fix him and make him look like somebody else. Uh, it never really works out. Uh, by the way, Karloff was an investor in the play. So uh, as part of the agreement, I'm sure that he got some residuals from the film as well. But he, he was such a crucial character in the play the play's producers uh, were reluctant to release him to be in the film, uh, less reluctant to allow the others uh, to appear in the film. So here you, here you see uh, Massey and uh, Dr. Einstein and Grant uh, threatening to do away with, with, uh, with Grant. And this, this is an important scene thematically, because one of the things I'll mention later on is um, the, the Cary Grant character is a theater critic. And all the way through, yes. he's saying how <laughs> theater doesn't represent life and how there's nothing real about theater. And in this scene, when you're watching it, uh, uh, you know, on the film or if you're reading it in the scene in the play, he is on the one hand saying, nobody could be so stupid as to let this kind of thing happen. And he describes what exactly does in fact happen to him. So what's interesting here is we have a play in which the critic is telling us that plays can't predict what real life is, when in fact the real life that's happening to him is that, you know, he gets, he gets caught up in this. So this, this kind of difference between, you know, real life and theatrical life is, is one that's particularly uh, noticeable in this, uh, in this scene. And there were other players of note in this film. Uh, John Alexander plays uh, cousin Teddy, who thinks he is Theodore Roosevelt, buries bodies in the basement and charges up the staircase yelling charge on a regular basis. Uh, he, he played in the film. He also played on uh, Broadway in the production. Uh, <laughs> One of the amusing stories about the picture below with the ants and Edward Everett Horton, a character actor of some note, in the initial film that was shown to the test audiences, uh, he was poisoned by the ants. Um, here you see him drinking the poisoned wine. Uh, and the audience reacted so negatively because, because uh, Horton was a noted character actor who was widely loved and appreciated. Uh, the, the filmmakers decided to take that particular segment out of the film. So he does survive. Uh, not pictured in the film, Jack Carl, Car, uh, Carson, uh, again, a notable character actor, often played the sidekick in films. And he's the, poli the policeman who is also a would-be author and tries to get Mortimer to read his script. And James Gleason, the suffering lieutenant 
who has to deal with the police as they investigate the alleged crimes here. Good, good. And this too, the, the Carson character is again, he's a, you know, in, in the play, he's a, a real cop who is trying to take his real life experience as a cop and turn them into uh, into a theater. So again, we have this uh, this theme of what's the relationship between reality and, you know, and, and the theater, theatrical world. Uh, and this is uh, getting ready to drink that uh, delicious <laughs> wine that may have a kicker Truly unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's Teddy in full dress here. And uh, I, I especially like the, the, the photo on the uh, uh, bottom uh, with Teddy holding his trumpet, which he would blow regularly as he ran up the stairs. And we are looking forward to seeing Jim Johnson from the Gallo Theater playing this role in the broadcast version. And we do have a picture of him in that role, and we'll see it in a few minutes. <laughs> and he does, I, I, he does, he does a fantastic see. job. <laughs> and he says bully and charge very well. Yeah, I think he's, I have to say, I just think he's having a really good time. In, yes, in, in, uh, <laughs> clearly. Yeah. So so some things to think about with the, um, with the play. Um, this is the 1940s. Um, and one of the things that, that people will talk about is that, um, um, you know, the theater, we start... Uh, we get um, in the 19th century, we have, you know, kind of melodrama. We start getting social issue plays in the late 19th century, early 20th century, you know, with, with Ibsen um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and that kind of naturalistic school. Um, and so one of the things that's kind of interesting about this play, which is a comedy, is that it's dealing with a lot of issues that are really serious um, that you could could easily put into a serious play. For example, the um, the two sisters are involved in charity. Now they take soup to the poor, to people who are sick. They help people out. Um, they're you know, but at the same time they kill people. But they're not killing them because they're mean in their mind. They're killing them because these people are lonely. Um, and so this goes to that, that kind of question of what do we do with people who are old, who are lonely, who are young and who are lonely? In other words, we're in a society that, um, you know, then as now, where, um, you know, people get isolated from their families, from their communities. And how do we kind of do that? That's a serious issue. This role of charity is a serious issue. Um, the, the theme of appearance versus essence is a really uh, important one. It's something that we see in, in literature and art all the way all the time. But here we get um, we get the uh, the Teddy Roosevelt character who is crazy. Uh, he appears to be crazy and he, in fact he is crazy, but he's not a bad guy. Um, we have the sisters who um, do not appear to be crazy, right? They are, appear to be normal and in fact they're murderers. Um, and we have the brother who appears to be evil and is in fact evil. So we have all of these three possibilities. Um, you know, the appearance doesn't lead us to the essence of something. And this is, you know, people will, you know, the, the kind of classic way of talking about this is all that glitters is not gold, right? Um, you know, in Frankenstein, the creature is ugly and people think he's evil, but especially if you've read the book, uh, he's a very good, sympathetic character. I'm trying to help people and right, rescue the girl and a number of things, helping the Lacey, the, the Lacey family in, in Switzerland. Um, all of these things are very positive, even though his essence is good, even though he appears to be um, ugly, right? Of course, he becomes, you know, he does eventually start doing terrible things. <laughs> the the um, theme of theater and reality, I, I think I've kind of staked out for us. The importance of World War II is, uh, is something else that's here. There are comments that the sisters make about baking and how they can't get certain kinds of supplies because of food rationing. Um, one of the sisters says, you know, with amazing, um, um, you know, a kind of understatement. I don't think I don't think Hitler is a very Christian, um, but uh, and and even there's a comment that the um, that the uh, minister makes about how uh, war and violence seems so far away from us. When in fact, of course, the house has a bunch of dead people in it, and he's having tea with murderers. So again, there's that appearance and essence thing going on. But I think that. Um, you know, in the back of, of Americans' minds, and you know, most, most of the world's mind at this point, is what's happening in, in, in the war. Um, 
it, it, you know, if America isn't yet involved, will it be? Once it's involved, what's going to happen? Europe is certainly already in the thick of it. Asia is well into the thick of it um, and parts of Africa as well. So the World War II is, 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 is out there as well. There's a, a kind of a, a theme that's hinted at here uh, against foreigners. The, um, the sisters don't want like... Uh, a foreigner, the guy that the guy that uh, that Jonathan killed, to be buried with their people who are all good kind of Americans and all Christian. And so there's very much this kind of weird them versus us thing uh, about well, he's a Methodist, but I guess it's okay. Um, and so that's you know that that idea of, of xenophobia is kind of interesting. Another issue that's really serious and that's treated here with com you know comically is mental illness and particularly the the genetics of mental illness that you know we know more about now although we still don't know everything what kind you know what is the role that the genes play in in um, in psychiatric disorders what roles are are um, uh, are environmental etc cetera, etc cetera, what are behavioral but uh, if you think about uh, a very, very serious treatment of mental illness just a few years later, the snake pit with Olivia de Havilland, it's a powerful, very serious, um, unsettling drama. And here, mental illness is just treated as really kind of funny. And one of the things critics have talked about is the, the kind of happy place uh, mental uh, institution where they, where they all end up at the end is very different from what, um, you know, newspaper muckrakers and... Um, and essentially, the media started to find out what those play, what those institutions really were like. That they were often very cruel and very dangerous places. So again, my point here is that although this is a comedy, it's dealing with a lot of serious stuff. But it, so it kind of gives us those things to think about. But then it entertains us by moving us along. One of the ways that it does this is by playing with genre, and genre just means type. So we have types of. Uh, we have, you know, genres of films like mysteries, westerns, sci-fi. We have genres of, of novels um, and we have genres of plays. Um, and classically, typically, if we go back to the Renaissance, to Shakespeare, um, there's this idea that genres are supposed to be separate. In other words, if you write a tragedy, it shouldn't have comedy in it. Um, and if you write a comedy, it shouldn't have tragedy in it. Um, and, and in some ways, Shakespeare does breaks this rule, and he gets criticized by the neoclassicist uh, critics in the 18th century for doing so. But if you think about it, in Hamlet, um, there's the gravedigger scene, which is a funny scene, especially what, you know. I mean, if you uh, it, it, you know that, that's a, that's a that's a that's a funny uh, uh, Billy Crystal does it, and it's a very funny scene. But most of the play is not funny. At the same time, we don't get an interaction between the comic scene and the tragic scene. If we think about Macbeth. Um, we have the, um, uh, the 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 drunken doorkeeper scene, um, and we also have you know, Lady Macbeth's mad scene, and they, they don't interact. In other words, you have one and we have the other. More typically, um, when people talk about Shakespeare mixing genres, uh, they're thinking of something like Merchant of Venice, which has is a very serious play about anti-Semitism, but also has romance and comedy and other kinds of things as well. So this idea of what are the genres and how do we mix the genres? One of the genres here is comedy. And in a certain sense, it's kind of a situation comedy. If you think about it, the two sisters are really neat, they're really tidy, and they're murderers. Um, Jonathan is really, and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Einstein are really sloppy and really kind of crazy, and they're murderers. It's the odd couple. What's the situation? There's a bunch of murderers. There's all these dead people, and their personalities are different. So it's in some ways it has elements of, uh, of, uh, of situation comedy. It definitely has elements of farce, which is very broad comedy, the physical comedy that we get, especially with the body and, and of, of comedy, literary comedy generally with some of the lines, some of the, the lines that are, that are given, some of the dialogue is quite funny. It has elements of the rom-com, and in a rom-com, the couple get together, they, um, they're going to be together, they break up for some reason, and they come back together, and they live happily ever after. That's exactly what happens here. Um, Cary Grant is, um, is in love. Uh, he proposes. They're going to get married. Then he realizes, oh, my God, I'm crazy. Um, I have genes in my family that are, that are madness. I can't get married. He breaks off the wedding, and then it turns out that he's adopted, and he can, in fact, go ahead with the wedding. So that has elements of the rom-com. The other thing, very obviously, it has is the elements of a police drama, of a gangster movie. There's all these murders. There's the police chasing, uh, chasing the, the essentially the mass murderers of Jonathan and Dr. Eisenstein. Um, so this is a crime drama. And then, as I said er in, 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 uh, earlier, 
thinking about the serious things that this play is about, it has elements of drama or melodrama. There are family problems, social issues like madness, alcoholism, Dr. Eisenstein, Einstein is, it drinks all the time, aging and loneliness. What do we do, you know, when people are alone and all of that? So again, these, um, on the one hand, this is a very entertaining play. I don't mean to make it like, oh, you know, it's a classroom and, you know, there's all this serious stuff. It's just really funny. You're really going to like it. You haven't seen it already. Um, but I think if you kind of start kicking it around, you'll see that it's treating a lot of these serious things as well. So you may be aware that we are doing this in partnership with the Gallo Center of the Arts in their presentation of Arsenic and Old Lace. Uh, Jim Johnson is going to play uh, the cousin, uh, and we have an all-star cast of players uh, who, uh, including Dave Weltner, a former student of mine, and others, uh, Wes Page, uh, MJC, videographer of great note, and uh, Mike Lynch, and a wonderful cast, uh, and you can see their presentation of Arsenic and Old Lace at HTTP, Vimeo.com with that number and compare it with the film. Here's a great, <laughs> a great photo of Jim uh, as cousin Teddy um, and actually simulating running up and down the stairs. We'll have to see how the videographer <laughs> presents this. And I don't know whether Jim can play the trumpet or not, but we will certainly find out. Uh, so do go see the broadcast, uh, do watch the film, which we are showing on Wednesday the 15th uh, at six o'clock at the State Theater, one time only, or view it on your own at the usual uh, places and ponder these questions, um, along with the ones and the issues that Arnold has raised. Uh, we, we have this running joke about this film. Does it really belong in a noir series? Well, in some respects, perhaps. In other respects, perhaps not. It was not, I should say, I should tell you Cary Grant's favorite film. He thought it was a bit too hysterical and some critics note that he was hoping the interim between the shooting of the film and its uh, release, it might have disappeared so he wouldn't have to apologize for it. Uh, his daughter, by the way, disagrees and says he was wonderful in the film. Uh, does the film hold up today? Uh, if the Coen brothers did a remake, um, how would that look? Uh, how does the film portray mental illness? Uh, Arnold has talked a bit about that already. And is there really a difference between the dozen murders committed by Abby and Martha and those of Jonathan? They seem to be in some sort of contest uh, over uh, numbers. Uh, but is, can you make a distinction between uh, the crimes uh, committed by the uh, aunts and uh, brother Jonathan. And that is an interesting issue because their intention of the aunts is that they think they're doing a good thing. Um, you know, um, there's this kind of classical idea. Aristotle talks about, um, about uh, people doing evil. And Plato talks about this too. Um, but this idea that people who do wrong don't necessarily think this is a bad action. I'm going to do it. They do it from a, an idea of mistaken good. So they don't think I'm going to steal your car because it's wrong. They think I need a car. There's a car. I'm going to take it. It's a good thing to have a car. So there's this difference between uh, evil in the sense of, uh, say, original sin, or I'm going to do evil because I am evil. I like evil. And, um, oh, I just did this, and it happens to be evil. And I think the ants certainly fall into that category. Their intention is, um, is good, even though it turns out bad. Um, you know, Jonathan, on the other hand, is bad. Uh, there's, there's really no question that his intentions are, he's driven by temper a lot. He's unable to control himself. And Aristotle tells us, you know, the Aristotelian mean, you should always be moderate with your emotions and rational. And Jonathan is, is none of those things. Certainly not. 
<laughs> so your homework, watch the Gallo Center's recreated broadcast between now and uh, next week. Watch the film on your own or at the State Theater. Oops, July 14th, not 15th. And participate in the discussion on July 15th, which will require your registration, which you could do at the State Theater's website. This, of course, is part of the first annual Modesto Noir series presented in partnership with the Prospect Theater Radio Cavalcade Players and the Gallo Center's uh, Broadcasting Series. Uh, we have one more film in this series and that is the classic noir, no argument here, The Maltese Falcon. Uh, we, uh, Arnold and I will do an introductory lecture uh, for, the, for the film and the broadcast on August 12th. <coughs> the, excuse me, the discussion will be on the 19th. Again, you will have to register at the State Theater if you would like to participate in the post-film, post-Broadway uh, broadcast um, uh, performance. We want to thank you so much for those of you who've been joining us for this Modesto Noir series. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, we've both really enjoyed it, and we hope that you've been enjoying it too. Uh, there's a lot of great uh, films and uh, radio plays that, that we've seen, and we're hoping to bring you a lot more of these in the future. Um, so um, until uh, we see you next week, thanks for joining us at Modesto Noir. And thank you. And don't drink any wine given to you by <laughs> old ladies. Before it's time. That's right. <laughs>